Chapter 22 Electromagnetic Induction This video is brought to you by Ace with Tennis. Now, learning can be smart, not hard. Don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification button to stop missing out free lessons from me. Electromagnetic Induction When a conductor moves in a magnetic field, it experiences an electromagnetic force. This phenomenon is called electromagnetic induction. How does it work? When a magnet moves in and out of a solenoid, its magnetic field lines, or known as flux, are cut by the coils. This induces electromotive force, or EMF, and if the solenoid is connected to a circuit, an induced current will flow through in the circuit. According to Lenz's law, the induced electric current always flows in the direction opposes the motion or change that induces it. Now, let's look at this experiment that shows Lenz's law. This is a bar magnet and this is a metal ring. The bar magnet falls through the metal ring. Now, what will we observe? We will observe that bar magnet slows down when approaches the metal ring. The reason is because, by Lenz's law, the metal ring opposes the motion of the bar magnet when it approaches the metal ring. Hence, a north pole is induced at the ring because light poles repel. So we use the right hand grip rule to determine the direction of the current flow. The thumb shows the north pole direction and the finger shows the current flow direction. If you observe from the top, this is the direction of flow of the current that we can see. And it is induced current. Now, this bar magnet leaves the metal ring. So, what will we observe? We observe that bar magnet slows down when leaves the metal ring. The reason is because, by Lenz's law, the metal ring opposes the motion of the bar magnet when it leaves the metal ring. Hence, a north pole is induced at the ring because unlike poles attract. So we can use the right hand grid rule to determine the direction of the induced current flow. The thumb shows the north pole direction and the finger shows the current flow direction. If you observe from the top, this is direction of the induced current flow. Electromagnetic induction in a solenoid. So this diagram shows a solenoid. And this is the bar magnet. It is stationary. There is no flux cut by the solenoid. There is no current induced in the solenoid. The governor meter does not deflect. Now, this bar magnet moves into the solenoid. According to Lenz's law, the solenoid induces north pole to oppose the bar magnet from approaching it. By using right hand grip rule, we can determine the direction of flow of the induced current. The thumb points to the direction of the north pole, and the finger shows the direction of the induced current flow. Hence, this is the direction of the current flow in the coil. The galvanometer deflects to the right. 
Now, let's look at this case. The bar magnet moves out of the solenoid. According to Lenz law, the solenoid induces south pole to oppose the bar magnet from leaving it. But this end will be the south pole and this end will be the north pole. We can use the right hand grip rule to determine the direction of flow of the current. The thumb points to the north pole direction and the finger shows the current flow direction. Hence, this is the direction of flow of the induced current in the solenoid. And the galvanometer deflects to the left. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. According to Faraday's law, the electromotive force or EMF induced in a conductor is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage through the conductor. Magnetic flux linkage is a measure of the amount of magnetic field lines passing through the conductor. EMF is induced when there is a change in the magnetic flux linkage by the movement of magnet or solenoid. The induced EMF in the solenoid can be increased by increasing the strength of the magnetic field by using a stronger magnet, increasing the number of turns in the solenoid, increasing the speed of the moving magnet or solenoid, placing a soft iron core in the solenoid to strengthen the magnetic lines of force through the coil. Fleming's right hand rule. Fleming's right hand rule is used to deduce the direction of the induced EMF or current flowing in a conducting wire. So, this is the Fleming's right hand rule. The thumb points up to the force applied. The index finger, which is perpendicular to the force or the thumb, points to the direction of the magnetic field from the north pole to the south pole. The middle finger, which is perpendicular to the index finger and the thumb, shows the direction of flow of the current. AC generator. So this is the basic structure of AC generator. These are permanent magnets and there is a rectangular coil between the poles of the magnet. This rectangular coil is connected to slip rings. The slip rings are connected to carbon brush. And the carbon brush is connected to a load. We can connect a voltmeter parallel to the load to measure the potential difference between the load. This is the rotational axis and the rectangular coil can be rotated in this direction. AC generators convert kinetic energy to electrical energy. The rectangular coil rotates about the rotational axis when external force applies on it. This causes the coil to cut the magnetic flux and hence electric current is induced and flows through it. Slip rings rotate together with the coil. The carbon brush keep in constant contact with the slip rings to complete the external circuit where an external load is connected. Now, let's learn how AC generator can generate electricity in the circuit. Let's say there is an external force applied on the red conductor in the downward direction. At the same time, there is an external force applied on the blue conductor 
at the upward direction. Hence, the rectangular coin rotates in anti-clockwise direction. We can use the Fleming's right hand rule to determine the induced current flow in the coil. So, let's look at the red conductor. The index finger is pointing at this direction from the north pole to the south pole, which shows the magnetic field. Then the thumb is pointing downwards, which shows the direction of the force. And you will see that your middle finger is pointing at, at this direction, which indicates the direction of flow of the current. Hence, the current will flow at this direction on the red conductor. Similarly, on the blue conductor, we point our index finger at this direction, which, show, which shows the magnetic field. And our thumb will point at this direction to show the direction of the force. And our finger will point at this direction, which shows the induced current flow. Hence, the current will flow in this direction on the blue conductor. Therefore, this is the current flow in the whole circuit. The force is perpendicular with the magnetic field lines. The coil cuts the most amount of magnetic flux. The induced EMF is maximum. So, when you want to plot the EMF against rotation graph at 0 degrees, the EMF is maximum. Now, the rectangular coil has turned 90 degrees. What will happen to the coil? So, the force applied on the red conductor is at this direction, while the force applied on the blue conductor is at this direction. The force is parallel with magnetic field lines. There is no EMF induced. Hence, the current is zero. Therefore, at 90 degrees rotation, the EMF induced is zero. Now, the rectangular coil has turned 180 degrees. The force applied on the red conductor is at upward direction. The force applied on the blue conductor is at downward direction. And this is the rotational direction of the coil. Again, we can use Fleming's right hand rule to determine the direction of flow of the induced current. The index finger is pointing at this direction to show the direction of the field. The thumb is pointing at upward direction to show the direction of the force. And we can see that our middle finger is pointing at this direction, which shows the direction of flow of the induced current. Hence, the induced current is flowing in this direction on the red conductor. Similarly, we can point our index finger at this direction to indicate the magnetic field direction. Our thumb is pointing downwards, which indicates the direction of the force. And we will find that our middle finger is pointing at this direction, which shows the direction of flow of the induced current. Hence, the induced current flows in this direction in the blue conductor. And this is the direction of flow of the induced current in the whole circuit. The force F is perpendicular with magnetic field lines. 
the coil cuts the most amount of magnetic flux and the induced EMF in opposite direction is maximum. Therefore, when you plot on the graph at 180 degrees, the induced EMF is maximum at the now the rectangular coil has turned 270 degrees. The force applied on the red conductor is in this direction and the force applied on the blue conductor is in this direction. And the coil is rotating in this direction. The force is, the force is parallel with magnetic field lines. No EMF is induced. Hence, the current is zero. At 270 degrees, the EMF induced is zero. Now, the rectangular coil has turned 360 degrees. The force applied on the red conductor is at the downward direction. The force applied on the blue conductor is at the upward direction. And this is the direction of the rectangular coil. We can use Fleming's right hand rule to determine the direction of flow of the current on the red conductor. The index finger is pointing at this direction to indicate the direction of the magnetic field. The thumb is pointing at this direction to show the direction of the force. The middle finger is pointing at this direction which shows the direction of flow of the induced current. Hence, the current flows in this direction in the red conductor. Similarly, we use the Fleming's right hand rule again to determine the current flow in the blue conductor. The index finger is pointing at this direction to show the direction of the magnetic field. The thumb is pointing at this direction to show the direction of the force. And we can see that the middle finger is pointing at this direction which shows the direction of flow of the induced current. Hence, the induced current is flowing in this direction on the blue conductor. And this is the complete flow of the current on the circuit. The force is perpendicular with magnetic field lines. The coil cuts the most amount of magnetic flaps. Hence, the induced EMF is maximum. When you want to plot the graph at 360 degrees, the EMF is maximum. This produces the complete EMF waveform on the graph. Now, Let's discuss how a bicycle dynamo works. This is the basic structure of a bicycle dynamo. The rotating ridge knob is attached to the bicycle tire. When the bicycle tire rotates, the knob rotates as well. A magnet is attached to the rotating knob. Below the magnet is the ion tong and the copper coil. The copper coil is attached to the light bulb. Magnet is rotated by the bicycle tire. When the magnet rotates, there is a rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. The current is induced in the copper coil and lights up the light bulb. Rectification Rectification is a process of converting alternating current AC to direct current DC. There are two types of rectification, the half-wave rectification and the full-wave rectification. Now, let's look at the half-wave rectification. This circuit shows half-wave rectification by using one diode. And this is the direction of flow of the current on the positive cycle. Notice that the input voltage is an AC input. The diode only allows the current to flow in one direction. So now let's compare the waveform for input voltage and the output voltage. 
when the input voltage is at the positive cycle, the output voltage follows because the diode allows the current to flow through it. However, when the input voltage is in the negative cycle, the direction of current flow is inverse. However, the diode does not allow the current to flow in the opposite direction. Therefore, there is no current flowing through the load and the output voltage will be zero. When the input voltage goes back to the positive cycle, the output voltage follows as well. So the process repeats and when the input voltage goes to the negative cycle, the output voltage will be zero. Hence, on the output voltage waveform, we can see that it only has the positive cycle. Now, let's look at full wave rectification. So this is the input voltage, which is connected to four diodes arranged in this manner. And the load is connected at these two points. We can connect a voltmeter parallel to the load. Now, let's compare to the the compare the waveform between the input voltage and the output voltage. When the input voltage is at the positive cycle, the current will flow in this direction, passing through this diode and enters the load, then flow back to the input voltage. Therefore, the output voltage will follow. When the input voltage is at the negative cycle, this is the direction of flow of the current and it will flow through this diode and continue to flow into the load back to the input voltage. Hence, the voltage output will follow but it is on the positive cycle. Now, the process repeats. When the input voltage is at the positive cycle, the current flows at this direction, enters the load and go back to the input voltage. Hence, the upper voltage follows. Similarly, go back to the negative cycle of the input voltage, the current continues to flow in this direction, passing through this diode, enters the load and go back to the input voltage. Therefore, the output voltage follow on the opposite cycle. And you can see the waveform for the output voltage. It is always positive cycle. Transformers. Transformers are used to increase or decrease the amplitude of AC voltage. Transformers will produce Deals zero output voltage if it is supplied with DC input voltage. So this is the basic structure of a transformer. It consists of the primary coil, the core, and the secondary coil. This is the symbol for the transformer. The transformer core is made from laminated soft iron core. The soft iron core is laminated to reduce energy loss due to eddy current. This is the transformer's formula. NP over NS equals VP over VS, where NP is the number of turns in primary coil. NS is the number of turns in secondary coil. VP is the primary voltage and VS is the secondary voltage. For an ideal transformer, the total input power of primary coil is equal to the total output power of secondary coil. Hence, the primary power equals to the secondary power. Therefore, VP IP equals VS IS. Or VP over VS equals IS over IP. 
and from the transformers formula np over ns equals dp over ds it is equals is over ip as well transformers that increase the amplitude of ac voltage are known as step up transformers transformers that decrease the amplitude of ac voltage are known as step down transformers a step up transformer has more number of turns of primary coil than the number of turns of secondary coil hence np is greater than ns on the other hand a step down transformer has more number of turns of secondary coil than the number of turns of primary coil hence ns is greater than np in real life transformers are not ideal there is power loss for non-ideal transformers we can calculate the efficiency of transformer using the following formula efficiency equals output power po over input power p in times 100 percent or vs is over vp ip times 100 percent transmission of electricity Electricity is transmitted from the power station to industries and homes using step-up and step-down transformers. This diagram is going to show you how power station transmit electricity to industries and homes. This power station generates a voltage V generate. It is connected to a step-up transformer, hence the prime primary voltage is V-gen and this is I-gen. The secondary voltage is V-out and it is connected to transmission lines. And this is the current I-out. Then the transmission line is connected to step-down transformer. Then the step-down transformer is connected to homes or industries. Usually, the resistance in cables are negligible as it has low resistivity. However, the length of transmission lines can be several kilometers or several hundred kilometers. From the formula of resistance, R equals rho L over A, the length of the transmission lines is long enough to make its resistance to be significant. The power loss due to the heating effect of current in the transmission line can be calculated by the formula P loss equals I out square R. The power loss is dependent to the current and the resistance. To reduce resistance, we can increase the thickness of the cables, which is to increase the cross-sectional area. However, this method is costly. It is more practical to reduce the current in the cable. To do this, we need to use step-up transformer to step up the voltage. From transformer formula, VP over VS equals IS over IP. When Vs increases, Is decreases. Referring to the diagram, V out is greater than V gen. Hence, I out is less than I gen. Small I out leads to smaller power loss. I voltage in transmission lines is then reduced by step down transformers to be used in industries and homes. Cathode ray oscilloscope or CRO. Cathode ray oscilloscope CRO is used to observe voltage waveforms. Let's look at the basic structure of CRO. First, it starts with the heater supply, which is used to heat up the cathode. After the cathode, there is a grid, followed by an anode. Cathode produces 
electrons. And these electrons gain energy from the heater supply. They are attracted by the anode and produces a beam of electrons. This region is electron gun region. This beam of electrons then passes through Y plate and X plate, which are responsible to guide the direction of the beam of the electrons. And this region is called the deflecting system. The beam of electrons continue to travel until it hits the fluorescent screen. Now, let's learn about how to read the waveform from cathode ray oscilloscope. So this is the outlook of a CRO. There are a few simple structures that you need to know. First, this is the screen. And you can observe the waveform from the screen. Then, there's a knob at the bottom. And this is to connect to probe, which the physical look of a probe is this. Also, there are two important knobs that you need to know. The first knob is the Y gain, which you can turn to determine the scale of the Y gain in a unit of volt per division. There are a few options that you can select. For this case, the number 2 is selected, which means for the Y gain, the scale is 2 volts per division. The second node that you need to know is the time base node. The time base node is responsible to set the scale of the time base in milliseconds per division. There are also a few options that you can choose. And for this case, number 2 is chosen, which means the scale for time base is 2 milliseconds per division. Now, let's look at the waveform in this screen. So, one small box is considered one division. From the waveform, first we need to identify the neutral position, which is on this line. Then, we can determine the amplitude. For this case, this amplitude takes two divisions. Therefore, the value of this amplitude is 2 division times 2 volt per division, which gives us 4 volts. This length tells us the period. And from this waveform, this period takes 4 division. Hence, the value of this period is 4 division times 2 milliseconds per division, which gives us 8 milliseconds. We also know that frequency equals to 1 over period, T. Hence, for this case, it is 1 over 8 times 10 to the power of 3, which gives us 125 hertz. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Do you have any question or doubts to ask? Feel free to write down in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Do you like this video? Please don't forget to like it and share it. Alternatively, you can also enroll this full revision course at Udemy. At Udemy. You can track your learning more effectively, download my notes in printable PDF form, take a summative quiz at the end of each chapter. Get your first-hand updated contents from me, get quicker response from me, and many more. You can get all these benefits at a very affordable price. It is one-time payment no recurring fees, no hidden costs.
This saves you thousands of dollars on expensive tuition fees and revision crash courses. And most importantly, your precious time. Finally, you can do your revision anytime you like, anywhere you prefer. All is available within your fingertips. Check out the description below this video and click on the enrollment link to register the course at discounted price. Alright, until then, see you in the next video. Have a great day ahead.